Welcome to Calvary Online, everyone. I'm Steph. It's a joy for us to gather together as one church in many different places as we worship the Lord and open the Word of God together. This is the third week in our summer shakeup for Calvary Online, where we're hoping to help you connect even better to one of our in-person campuses. You can watch one of our services from Boulder, Erie, and Thornton online every week. And if there are ways we can help you get connected to one of our campuses, you can let us know through the online connect card anytime. We wanna invite you to pray with us for the nearly 200 people who are going on the middle school Maranatha retreat this week. We're praying for safety for them, that they would have genuine interactions with the Lord and that they would have a lot of fun as they get to know Him and one another better. June this year has been an amazing month as we have celebrated many of our missionaries. We've sent out multiple teams across the world and invited our Haitian pastors from Step Seminary in Haiti here for a retreat. We're so thankful for the way that we're able to serve the world through missionary teams, to bless them as they come here. And we couldn't do that without the generous gifts of Calvary. If you wanna give online this week or regularly, you can do that online anytime. We love you, Calvary, we're thankful for you. Now let's open the word of God together. Thanks. Grateful to be here this morning with you all in Boulder. I spent about six years here in Boulder doing student ministry, and so love the students here and have missed being with you all and with the community here in Boulder. But now I'm working at the Erie campus, still with Calvary, doing mostly men's ministry and continuing a role I've been doing in global outreach while continuing to work on a seminary degree. And so it's great to just be here this morning and to do something I love being able to do, which is worship together and open God's word together. We're continuing in this series, Unsung Heroes, where we're looking at lesser known figures throughout scripture. And admittedly, I chose a figure in scripture who's somewhat well known. Maybe you've heard the story of Gideon before, or maybe this is your first time. But regardless, my hope for you this morning is that you would be able to discover and learn something new about doubt and faith as we open this text together. We're going to be predominantly in Judges 6 to 8. And for the beginning time, as we're telling the story, the text won't be up on the screen. So I encourage you to grab a Bible if you have one in front of you. Uh, and there's one in the seat in front of you. So Judges 6 to 8, and that's where we'll be starting. We can probably all resonate with the question, why is this happening right now? Why is this happening right now? Perhaps in the last several years, throughout your life, at some point, you've asked the question, God, why am I going through this crisis, through this grief, through this loss, through this pain? And where are you? Do you actually see me in the midst of what's going on? Do you care for me in the midst of what's going on? Are you doing something bigger in the midst of this crisis and this pain? Where are you and why is this happening? Questions that we're all bound to ask at some point in our life. And it's with those questions that our story of Gideon really begins, where Gideon is asking the Lord, where are you in the midst of our crisis? And why is this happening? In Judges 6.1, we get the beginning of the story and it sets the scene for us in the book of Judges chapter six, as we look at the story of Gideon. It says this, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. The people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he gives them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, the book of Judges is kind of like a bad song on repeat. While someone keeps turning up the volume each time it gets repeated, because what's happening in Judges is that the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And yet they were liberated. They were brought out of slavery and eventually brought into the land that God had promised them where he would be their God and they would be his people. But as they're there, there's this issue that keeps happening. And that's that they keep on forgetting God. And as they forget God, they look around to the gods of the nations around them. 
And they begin to worship those gods. They begin to serve those gods. And so God raises up an enemy who will overcome and take his people, Israel, captive. So that they then cry out to God and say, God, help us in our crisis. Help us in our need. Be here with us. And then God answers them. And he raises up a judge, a ruler, who brings them freedom. And this is one of the cycles in the book where they've again forgotten God. And now their enemy has overtaken them. And they've cried out to God for help. And this time their Israel enemy is Midian. And Midian is described like locust in abundance, this massive army, this massive horde who's coming into Israel and they're camping out against them. They're taking their ox, their sheep, their donkey. They're taking their food, their produce, all that they have to live on. And they're robbing the land and leaving Israel desolate. And it's been seven years of suffering under the hand of the Midianites and the people of Israel are desperate. And that's where our story begins. As the angel of the Lord, who's often identified with Yahweh, approaches our figure, Gideon. And Gideon, at this time, when the angel of the Lord approaches him, when God approaches him, is doing something somewhat odd. He's beating out wheat in a wine press. Now, I know in our culture, we don't probably beat out wheat very much, so we might not have a context for this, but you could probably guess what you would normally make in a wine press. It'd be wine. You'd put grapes in there. You'd crush them. You'd hew it out from a rock. And then in this hewed out rock, you would crush grapes and the grapes would drip down. And that was the point of a wine press. But a threshing floor was where you would normally beat out the wheat. And so there's an odd clue in verse 11 that something is off. That Gideon is in a wine press processing wheat. Because the reason he's doing this is because the wheat field or the threshing floor would have been an open space. And he is afraid likely of losing his food, and more likely also for his life. Afraid that if he is out there and exposed, his enemy is going to overtake him. And so God appears to a hiding Gideon to start the story. And this is what verse 12 says of chapter 6. The Lord appears to Gideon and says this, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor, says to a hiding Gideon. And then Gideon in verse 13 says this, in response to the Lord saying, I'm with you, he says, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Do you hear what Gideon's saying? The Lord's approaching him and God says, I am with you. And he says, if you're with us, why has this happened? Where are all your great deeds? We heard about how you once saved your people from slavery in Egypt, but now our enemy has overtaken us. Where are you in the midst of this? Where are all your great deeds that we've heard about? So God tells him, go in this might of yours, Gideon. Go in the strength of yours and free the people of Israel. But Gideon's uncertain. So in verse 15, he says, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. But God promises him that he will be with him. But Gideon wants a sign. He wants a sign to know that it's really the angel of the Lord, that, that God is really speaking to him. And so he asks for a sign from God. And so Gideon does as he's told, and he prepares a sacrifice. He puts it on a rock. And the angel of the Lord reaches out the tip of the staff and consumes the, consumes the offering with fire. And at this point, Gideon says in verse 22, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's seen the angel of the Lord. And now it's time for reform. The Lord has asked him to save the people of Israel. And he's got a great task before him. But before he goes and defeats his enemy, he has to deal with his own house. He has to clean house in Israel because Israel has begun to worship these other gods, if you remember. They've begun to worship another god called Baal and another god called Asherah. And so God tells Gideon, here's what you need to do. You're going to go and you're going to tear down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah pole. And then in the place where people were sacrificing to another god, I want you to give a sacrifice to me. 
And so we're told that Gideon does this. But verse 27 tells us that Gideon does this at night because he's afraid. He's afraid of the people of the town, the men of the town, and he's afraid of his own family because even his own dad, Joash, is involved in this idol worship. The next morning, when people arise, they see that the idols have been broken down. The altars have been broken down to their gods. And they begin to ask, who's done this? Who's broken down the altar? And they begin to search and inquire. And they find out that it's Gideon. That Gideon is the one who's broken down the altar. So this is where Gideon gets his nickname, Jerubbabel. And the nickname comes about because Gideon's dad, Joash, who though he was involved in idol worship in the past, begins to defend him. He says, look, Gideon broke down the altar of Baal, but if Baal's a god, don't kill my son Gideon. Let Baal contend against him. Let Baal have his vengeance. Let Baal take care of him if he's really a god. But you leave him alone. Defends his son. And so Gideon gets his nickname here, Jerubbabel. Jerubbabel, which means this, let Baal contend against them. And another name for Gideon then becomes, let Baal contend against them. Let Baal come against them because he has come against Baal. And after doing this, it's time to go and attack, in, to go and deal with the enemies who have come into the town. We're told in verse 33 that the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east, this massive horde, has encamped against Israel and they're preparing again to do what they've been doing, which is raiding the land and taking their goods. And Gideon prepares to go into this battle, but first he wants another sign that God is actually with him. And so Gideon does something unique. In verse 36, he says to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. We're told that it was so. And so Gideon lays this fleece of wool on the threshing floor where they were to process the wheat. And the, the fleece is soaking wet, but the ground is dry. But then Gideon wants another sign. He says, okay, let, let's reverse this, God. This time, I want, I want the ground to be wet, and I want the fleece to be completely dry. Don't become angry with me, but just, just one more sign. Show me that you're really with me. Show me that you're really going to use me to save the people of Israel. And we're told the next morning that, again, it was just as he asked. The fleece is dry. The ground is wet. And so Gideon and his men camp out against the enemy. They have 32,000 soldiers who are about to go against a massive army of about 135,000. But before they go into battle, in Judges 7, verse 2, we're told this, that the Lord says to Gideon, the people with you are too many. 135,000 versus 35,000, or versus 32,000. The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boasts over me saying, my own hand has saved me. So it says, Listen, Gideon, you have too many people. Anyone who's afraid, let them go home. And those who go home are 22,000, and there's 10,000 men left in the army. But then God says, as he looks at this army of 10,000 versus 135,000, he says, the people are still too many in verse 4. And he has them do another test. He takes them down to the water, and everyone who drinks the water, like a dog, who picks it up and laps it up out of their hand, they're the people who God is going to use to save Israel. But everyone who kneels down to drink water, God says, let them go home. And the result is that there's an army left of just 300 men who God is going to use to save the people of Israel, who Gideon will lead into battle. So it's time to get their battle plans into place. But before, it's, it's the night before the battle. And as they're preparing to go in, the Lord appears to Gideon in Judges 7 verses 9 through 11 says this arise go down to the camp for i've given it into your hand god's saying to gideon gideon look you have victory i've given this into your hand but he says but if you are afraid to go down to the camp go down to the camp with prayer your servant and you shall hear what they say and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp so god tells him gideon look if, if you're afraid go down with your servant Pura. And you're going to hear something that will encourage you. And so Gideon and his servant, the night before the battle, sneak into the camp. And while they're there, they hear one of their enemies 
telling about a dream to one of their comrades. They say, I had this dream that this cake of barley started rolling through the camp and it smashed the tent and turned it upside down. And the person who hears it says, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And Gideon, hearing on the lips of his enemy that he has victory, is greatly strengthened. It says in verse 15 that he worships. He worships. And so he puts his plan into action then, the plan that's been given to him. They divide the men into three camps, 300 men into three different camps, and they give them torches and jars. And they surround the camp of the enemy. And they prepare, and Gideon says, do as I tell you, do as I tell you when it's time. So they surround the camp of the enemy. And when it's time, They break their jars, they blow their trumpets, and they yell, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And when they do that, we're told that the enemy just loses it. They turn on one another with their swords. There's this mass confusion that comes over the camp, and the enemy begins to fight one another, killing each other, defeating one another. And then they begin to flee. And we're told about how Gideon and his army go and they capture and defeat the princes of Midian. Then they track down, eventually, the kings of Midian as the story goes on. And so this is the story of Gideon and how God gives Israel freedom from their captivity through Gideon and the 300 men. And so the question we want to ask is, what do we learn from this story? What do we take away from this story? One of the first things we see in this story is that it's a time of crisis. It's a time of crisis. Gideon is likely fearful for his life, hiding, beating out wheat in the wine press. And it's in this time of crisis that God calls Gideon to live out faith. When God calls Gideon to do something great, to reform the nation, to to bring an end to the false worship, and to bring freedom from their captivity. And so Gideon leads out an army of 300 men to defeat their enemy. And he smashes the altar of Baal and pulls down the altar. It's likely, as we mentioned before, that the army that they were against was about 135,000. So imagine for a second, how much faith would this take if you're Gideon? God comes to you and says, you're going you're to defeat this army of 135,000. But you're going into battle with 35,000. But God says, no, you know what? 35,000, that's too many. If you're Gideon, wouldn't you almost want to be like, hey, God, let's do the math for a second. They have us by about four to one right now. Four to one. Like, this would, this would be a good victory for us. This would be something to boast about. And we could give you the credit if we do it with 35,000. But God says, no, no, this is too many. It's too many. You will take the credit if you get victory right now. Because let's, let's cut it down to 10,000. At that point, you're Gideon, you might say, all right, God, this is, this is 13 to one. They have us. Like, this, this is great. You're going to be the one who clearly gets the victory. This is all glory to God, right? And God says, no, 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 still too many. Cut it down to 300. Ratio of 450 to 1. 450 to 1. God wants to make it abundantly clear that if there's going to be victory, it is not because Gideon is awesome or because these 300 men are strapping and strong and mighty. That the victory is going to be from the hand of God. And even when they go into battle, consider how they get victory. They blow trumpets, break jars, and yell. And their enemy just turns on themselves. They lose it. That's how they're going to get victory. It seems that God is making it abundantly clear that he is the one who's going to get the victory. But you can also imagine how much faith it would have taken for Gideon to go into this battle. To go in with 300 men, fearful for his life, and yet to believe that God is going to deliver him. To trust God in the midst of that hardship. And here we see an example of what faith looks like. Even at times where the odds seem just completely stacked against us. Where it seems impossible for God's word to come true. Where it seems like the odds are 450 to 1. To believe that God is actually going to deliver on his promises, even when things might seem bleak. And there's plenty of things that might look bleak in our world. As we look at global 
catastrophes, when we look at global wars going on, when we look at a pandemic and supply chains, there's all these issues that are worldwide issues and local issues, issues that we have in our own community, our own lives, the crises that we go through. Just this last week, I spent some time with some uh, professors and leaders from a seminary in Haiti, Step Seminary, you, who you've likely heard about. And they were sharing just some of the crises that they've gone through, losing their main campus to gangs, one of their faculty losing one of his sons to gang violence, uh, just randomly caught in crossfire, losing, uh, losing so much of the security and safety that they would desire to have and just the anxiety and the difficulty and the challenges of persevering. And one of the things they talked about was having a perspective of faith or having the perspective that God has for them. This, this different lens, this different perspective they were speaking about. And I, I think it relates to this, looking with the lens of faith, believing that God is able to deliver. Because there are going to be things in our life where we just wonder, God, where are you? Are you present? Do you care? Are you using this for good? Like, like we've heard about the great things you did. We, we read the scriptures and we read about the exodus from Israel. Is that just history and dead? Or is, is God, God, are you here in my life in a way that's like that? We, we've heard about Jesus, how he raised the dead, how he healed the sick, how he, he came to the shame and the outcast and he gave them grace and mercy. But we might at times feel like, God, I don't know that in my life right now. I don't feel your presence. In those challenges, in those crises, it takes faith. And in the midst of our challenges today, we have before us the example of Gideon, of what it looks like to believe God when things are dark and uncertain. And so the first lesson we learn from this story is from the faith of Gideon. We learn that we should be like Gideon, someone who trusts God when things are dark and impossible and uncertain. So the first thing we learn from this story is that we should be like Gideon, which leads us naturally to our second point, which is that we should not be like Gideon. We should not be like Gideon. I left some intentional details out of this story for you. But if you read this whole story, you realize that Gideon is not a perfect example of much. Gideon does have faith, but he also struggled a lot with doubt. And his own generational legacy is pretty bad. It's, it's honestly a train wreck. Gideon in the story is characterized by doubt and uncertainty. Three times he asks for a sign from the Lord that God is really with him. First time God gives him the sign, he, he consumes the offering that Gideon gives him. But even right after that, even as he seems so strengthened, he's afraid. And when God asks him to do something, he does it at night in fear of the people. He's afraid of the men of the town and of his own family. So he does this act of tearing down the altar at night. He's afraid. He's uncertain. Uh, before he goes into battle, he, he asks for a sign from God with the fleece. He asks, could you let this fleece be wet, this fleece of wool be wet, and the ground be dry? Then even after that, he says, okay, give me one more sign. Let's, let's, have, let's reverse it. This time, I want the ground to be wet and the fleece dry. And as you look at the story of the fleece, it might just seem like an odd story. Why the fleece of wool and dew? But here's something really important to know. Gideon's nickname, as we mentioned, is Jerubbabel, which means let Baal contend against them. Because <clears throat> Gideon tore down the altar of Baal. But Baal is also known as a mighty warrior god and the god who controls lightning and dew. And so think for a moment about what Gideon's actually asking. He's saying, God, they've given me a name. They said, let Baal contend against him, Jerubbabel. But what if he does? What if he does come against me? Can you give me a sign that you are actually present? That you're not just going to leave me? That you won't forsake me? That you won't forget me? That you won't let Baal contend against me? So they say he's a great God. And I need some assurance that you're actually with me, that you're more powerful, and that you can get me through this. They've named me, let Baal contend against them, but I want to know that you're on my side, if he does. He was uncertain. He was fearful. 
He was anxious, even as he went into battle. But he also leaves a poor legacy for his own family. After he gets this great victory over the Midianites, the people ask him, they say, Gideon, we want to make you and your son, your offspring, to rule over us. We, we want you and your lineage to rule over us. And he says in Judges 8.23, he says, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Now, on the face of it, this is a great answer. This is a good answer. Gideon shouldn't appoint himself king. That's not his role. God's role is to appoint the king. But even as Gideon says, I'm not going to be made king, he kind of goes on to do the things that bad kings do. For example, in Deuteronomy 17, we're told several things that kings aren't supposed to do. And two of them are, you shouldn't get a bunch of wives. That's a no-no. And you shouldn't get a bunch of gold. Those two things are bad for kings. You should not do those. And yet, Gideon, who would have had this word from God, goes on to take for himself a bunch of wives. And he gathers gold from the plunder. And from the gold, he makes a golden ephod, which would have been a garment that a priest would have worn in their service in the temple. And we're told in Judges 8.27 that Gideon places this golden ephod from the spoils of the battle, places this golden ephod in his hometown, and that there in Israel, all in, in his hometown, all Israel hoard after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Think about that for a moment. This is great Gideon, Jerubbabel, the one who contends against the gods, who contends against Baal, who is now leading his people back into idol worship. He's failed them. He builds this idol that his own family begins to fall prey to, and he himself begins to fall prey to. He's going back into idol worship like his father. And after Gideon gets this victory, there's, there's 40 years of peace in the land. But after those 40 years, we're told in Judges 8.33, Gideon dies, and the people turn away from God. They make Baal Barith their God. They whore after the Baals. This is the story of Gideon. And if that wasn't enough for his legacy, to top it off, he names one of his own sons Abimelech. Remember, he says, I'm not going to be your king. I, I won't be made king over you. But he names a son Abimelech. And this is a son who comes through one of his concubines. And this is what Abimelech means. It means, my father is king. Not a great name to give to your son if you're saying you're not a king. And so some people expect that maybe Gideon didn't quite reject kingship in the way he should have. He wasn't the perfect leader that the people needed to lead them forward. And even his own son, Abimelech, my father is king, makes a plight for his own kingship. He kills the other 70 sons of Gideon. All but one escape, Jotham. He turns on his own brothers, kills the 70 sons of Gideon, and one escapes. He makes his own plight to become king, and he eventually is killed. And so if you were to do a Bible study on generational leadership, I would not recommend Gideon as your positive example. His own life ends in tragedy. So it puts us in an odd spot, because Gideon's really not the hero of this story. And if Gideon's not the hero of the story, then who is? I think the answer is clearly that God is the hero of this story. I mean, isn't that why God says, you have too many people? I know that they would think they're the heroes. They would think that the victory belongs to them. So let's whittle it down to 300 men to make it abundantly clear that victory and salvation belongs to the Lord. Yet at the same time, we should realize that though God is the hero of this story, that does not mean that God does not use Gideon. I, I think you can think about it this way. We're going to put God in the big H hero category. God is the big H hero, the ultimate hero of the story. And yet somehow God, as a gracious God, really does use Gideon for his purposes. He really does use Gideon. And it's good news for us that our God is not like Gideon, that, that our God is the ultimate hero that goes from story to story in Scripture. And even as we read the whole Bible, we know that the ultimate hero of Scripture is Jesus Christ, the one who brings peace, not just for 40 years like Gideon, but who brings eternal peace to
to his people. Yet, even as we read this story, Gideon is used by God in heroic ways. So I think we can make Gideon a hero with, with a little h. He's a little h hero. He really is used by God. And the fact that God is hero is not a threat to him really using Gideon in significant ways. And so we do see failures in the life of Gideon. Yet it's also true that there are parts of Gideon's life that we truly want to imitate. And yet, how, how amazing is it that we have a God like this? A God who uses people like Gideon and like you and me, who are flawed, ordinary, simple people. But nonetheless, God is able to use for extraordinary things. So on one hand, it's accurate to say that you should be like Gideon. But on the other hand, it's accurate to say that you should not be like Gideon, which leads us to our final point, which is simply this, that we are like Gideon. As we read this story, and as we look at it, we see Gideon, a flawed character. But notice the grace of God towards Gideon throughout the whole story. I mean, Gideon struggles with doubt. But what follower of Jesus has never struggled with doubt? And what I want to notice in this story is not just the fact that Gideon struggles with doubt, but how does God deal with a doubting Gideon, a fearful Gideon, an uncertain Gideon, a hiding Gideon? How does God deal with Gideon in his doubt and uncertainty? Gideon asks for three signs from the Lord. And how many signs does God give him? Kind of a trick question. It's actually four. And the fourth, the fourth sign that God gives him seems to be completely unprompted by Gideon. Gideon's asked for the signs. He's asked for the sacrifice that the angel of the Lord consumes. Then there's the two times it's the fleece of wool. But then the fourth time is in Judges 7, 9 through 11. And this is the fourth sign that the Lord gives to Gideon. He says in verse 9, Arise, go down to the camp, for I've given it into your hand. He's saying, Gideon, victory is yours. You have it. This victory is yours. But verse 10, but if you are afraid, if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with prayer your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. See, God's even giving Gideon the courage to go into battle. He says, Gideon, I, I know you're feeble. I know you're uncertain. I know that you struggle with fear. We've seen it three times and I've given you three signs. But now, once more, the night before the battle, if you're afraid, Gideon, go down to the camp and I will strengthen you. You will hear your victory proclaimed on the lips of your enemy and you will have strength to go to battle. I just see this as, as God approaching Gideon like a loving father, picking up his son, loving him, caring for him, knowing that he's feeble, knowing that he's weak, knowing that he can't walk on his own, and helping him to walk, helping him to move forward. This is the heart of God that we see towards Gideon in his doubt. This is how God deals with his doubting servant, Gideon. He's gracious and merciful. He doesn't just get fed up and say, Gideon, look, I've showed you. I did the fleece thing twice. This is enough. Just go into battle. Just if you are afraid, I will strengthen you. I can give you what you need. So the question we want to ask then today is, is how do we think God deals with us in our weakness? How do we think that God deals with us in our doubt? Like there, there's weaknesses that we all have. Different areas of, of inadequacy, of painfulness, of shame, of, of difficulty and trial in our lives. And maybe for you, it's, it's doubt. How, how does God deal with you in your doubt? Does he just say, enough, enough. I, I've shown you, I've told you. Why don't you believe? Is he at the end of his rope, just ready to bring down the hammer? Or is he like the God who we see in the story, who approaches Gideon in grace? Is, is he like Jesus? Jesus is the fullest expression to us of the heart of God. He's the fullest expression of God, God himself coming to us in the flesh. Think about doubting Gideon. Think also about doubting Thomas, one of Jesus' followers, Thomas, who, who walked with Jesus during his lifetime, but after Jesus has risen from the dead, says, I, I'm not going to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead unless I, unless I see the mark in his hands. And, and I place my finger in his hands where the nails were, and I place my finger in his side. 
But how does Jesus approach him? Jesus approaches him and says, see my hands. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my hands. He invites him to see and touch. Now, I know that we cannot physically see Jesus today. And Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. But is it also not true that in this story, we again see the heart of God towards his people and their doubt? This is the heart of God seen in Christ towards the doubting Thomas. It's the same heart that we see in God towards the doubting Gideon. One of the dangers I think that we can have when we struggle with doubt is that we feel like we almost need to move away from God and figure our things out before we approach him. If I'm struggling with God, doubt, I'm, I might feel like I, okay, I shouldn't be around um, his word. I kind of just need to be on my own and figure out what I believe and what, what's going on. And maybe I can take a break from the Bible, take a break from prayer. I'm not saying that prayer and reading the Bible fixes everything, but take a break from the church, take a break from community. But the reality is this, that the safest and best place to be with our doubts is in the presence of God. There's no better place than to be with God himself in the midst of our doubts. Because who else can strengthen our doubts? Who else can strengthen us in the midst of our uncertainty and give us courage? What we see in the story of Gideon is that God is the one who's able to give him strength. What we see in the story of Jesus with Thomas is that Jesus himself approaches Thomas and is able to strengthen him. It's the same heart that God has towards us today in our doubt. God does not change. He's unchanging, immutable, today and yesterday and forever the same. And this is the heart of God towards his people and their weakness. So my encouragement for you is if you're struggling with doubt, just know that you can be in the presence of God, that actually that's the safest and best place to be. God was able to strengthen a doubting Gideon to take on a massive army with 300 men. He was able to strengthen a doubting Thomas to, to continue his ministry and to carry on. He can strengthen a doubting Mark, a doubting you, doubting anyone. He's able to strengthen his people in their doubt. Now, at the end of the story, you might be wondering, is Gideon a hero? Is he actually a hero? Good news is Hebrews 1132, which some people call the Hall of Faith. It lists these great people of faith throughout history who are looking forward to the Messiah. Hebrews 1132 mentions Gideon. And the author, as he's telling about all these great heroes of the faith, says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets. The author of Hebrews is saying, I, I wish I could tell you about all the great faiths that these people have gone before you. I wish I could just tell you about the great faith of Gideon. He made it end. He made it end. He was used by God in his day. He is a flawed character, but a character who God used. A character like you and me, imperfect, yet God was able to graciously and mercifully use him. And he goes down in the story of scripture, remembered, yes, that he is flawed, but also remembered as one of the heroes of the faith. Someone who lived out faith in his day and awaited the Messiah. So there are ways we should emulate Gideon. There are ways we should not emulate Gideon. But the truth is, we often find ourselves in the place of Gideon. And yet the good thing for us today is to know that we have a God who is gracious and merciful to us, who can strengthen us in our weaknesses and doubts. And there may be areas of your life that you feel like disqualify you for service to God, areas where maybe you've been praying and asking for God for help, and you feel like you cannot be used by God. And absolutely want to seek God and grow in these areas. But also I just want to give a suggestion that perhaps some of the areas of weakness in our life are, are the very areas where God is going to show his power. I mean, why, why an army of 300? Because God's the one who gets the victory. Maybe in your own life, there's areas of weakness and pain and hardship that the Lord has graciously left there. And at the end of it, we'll say, God, all glory be to you. Your power was made perfect in my weakness. Your strength was made known in my weakness. And if we are today doubting, uncertain, fearful, ashamed, whatever issues we have, we have the confidence that we can approach a God who is gracious and merciful to his people in their weakness. We can approach Jesus Christ, who is able to strengthen his people in their time of need. So let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your grace that we do see in this story. We thank you that you use simple, ordinary people to accomplish your extraordinary purposes, that you use the doubting Gideon. Lord, and I pray that we would excel in faith, that we would grow in faith, that we would pursue and walk with you. But I pray also just for anyone here doubting or uncertain, they're fearful or ashamed this morning. I pray that your grace in the story would be seen. I pray that we would know that we can come to Jesus Christ, who strengthens his people in their time of need, is able to give us the energy to persevere. Lord, I pray in the crises and the hardship and the difficulty that we're going through today, that we would know your presence, that we would know your nearness, that we would know your kindness. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time to be together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We taught you this song last week. We invite you to sing again with us. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Yeah. My shame was a ransom, be faithfully born. He came to my death, and he called me his friend. When that was arrested in my life, we yeah. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over.
you pray with me? God, we thank you this morning for, for that day in history when death was arrested, you rose from the grave and you showed yourself to be who you said you were all along, King, Lord, Creator, and Savior. God, there is no one like you. Every other claimed deity uh, is dead, but you're not. You're alive and you're well. And so we say thank you for your resurrected life and the power that that brings. We pray that uh, we live in light of that this week. Uh, Teach us this morning uh, from your word like only you can do. God, move in power. We love you. We open ourselves to you. We say thanks for who you are and for what you've done, for loving us first. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Amen.